Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am Cesar Mesa, a senior at Captain John L. Chapin High School, working with Dr. Jorge Munoz's research cohort. Thank you kindly for joining me today as I present my work on the simulation of programmable matter with mathematical graphs. The dream of manipulating matter has captivated the imagination of scientists and industrialists alike for over 30 years. But now, it's only a matter of time before that dream turns into a reality. Researchers from the Self-Assembly Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have pioneered what is known as four-dimensional printing, the creation of structures that change shape with signals ranging from humidity to heat, from magnetic ferrofluids, such as the one depicted, to physical systems capable of contracting uniformly, known as auxetics. More firms around the world are getting closer to deliberately changing the shape of materials. However, Many current strides in programmable matter work with geometric structures and large-scale materials, focusing less on the most basic kind of matter, atoms. Shifting atoms into different structures we choose is the ultimate end of building with truly dynamic materials, and one of the most difficult to achieve. Our work attempts to develop a program capable of simulating interactions between atoms in a simple lattice structure. Through such a simulation, we can ultimately gain insight into possible ways of individually moving particles to form new structures. It is absolutely imperative to acknowledge the work of Dr. Tomasa Tofali from MIT. He spearheaded the idea that cellular autonomy, simple lines of code, could lead to programming atoms to behave in predetermined ways. Our work closely parallels his initial speculation. However, to tackle such a big problem, one must first start small and simulate the behavior of a cluster of atoms. Our simulation assumes that there is an isolated lattice of 64 atoms, arranged like a 4x4x4 four by four by four Rubik's Cube. As an abstraction, imagine that the forces between them act as springs, repelling each other if they get too close. By doing so, we can use Hooke's law to model the behavior of the lattice. If we wanted to change the structure of the lattice, we would have to introduce an external force or impact, which would propagate a wave. If the impact is strong enough, particles would ideally be able to break off from its position. I mean, just imagine a spring becoming deformed or broken if you stretched it too far. Through this behavior, the program ultimately simulates ways of programming the atoms to take new positions and create a different shape mathematical graphs to model this behavior. Now, usually when you think of a graph, you imagine two or more axes in a pattern of data. But of course, graphs pertain to almost any visual representation of a relationship between two or more objects. Our graphs, with each node, we represent a particle, and with each edge, we represent the spring-like forces between them, kind of like the figure on the bottom right. Of course, we had to make a couple of assumptions when developing this code. First, we assume that all energy is transferred perfectly, that there's no loss of energy. Also, that all atoms have the exact same mass, and we assigned values arbitrarily, such as the spring constant and the initial collision's energy level, for the sake of simplicity. For the creation of this code, we decided to use Python 3.7 primarily because we're comfortable with it, but also because it has two downloadable packages for making graphs, NetworkX and Matplotlib. All of the changes and calculations are made using the NetworkX package, but unfortunately you can't really see what's going on. It gives you this jumbled mess as in the top right. But that's where we use the matplotlib package to create this refined visual that's directly below it. Therefore, you get two interdependent graphs. All of the changes are made on one, but they appear on both. And later, it creates the stop motion animation after each timestamp that the simulation is run. The simulation actually works quite simply. First, it generates the graph, and each node is assigned a coordinate. Then, the edges are also encoded using the first two fundamental equations. Afterward, the program asks the user to select a particle and input the initial energy of a collision. Then, the simulation runs for about 20 times. For each node in the graph, it checks if there are positions or velocities that are changing anywhere near it. If there is, it uses the equations to generate new positions and velocities. The image is updated, and it repeats. Here are actually some of the behaviors that you can see when using our program. The first to the left shows a simple collision that came from the origin, while the one in the middle actually shows a separation of a particle if the energy level is too high, leading it to stem off from the rest of its partners. For the sake of simplicity, the one on the far right is just a graphic that shows the simple mechanics of an oscillation and how they are demonstrated in our program. 
Ultimately, after about two months of development, we were able to create this preliminary simulation that modeled behavior of simple lattices. While the simulation doesn't provide a clear-cut answer for the feasibility of programming atoms, it does present a series of interesting implications. Firstly, it recreated physical behavior with simple logic. Secondly, it accomplished the goal of recreating vibrations within a lattice. And finally, it demonstrated the capability of these particles to separate. In the end, we can essentially recreate machine learning with atoms. Each of these behaviors takes a significant step towards modeling Dr. Toffoli's idea that atoms are capable of changing to predetermined positions with predetermined actions. Of course, this work is far from complete, but please allow me to allay some of the questions and fears concerning its validity. You might worry how helpful this simulation may be because it oversimplifies several complex phenomena. However, this simplicity is exactly what helps us to understand fundamental behaviors. If we introduce too many factors right off the bat, we won't directly quantify what causes the reactions we see. Also, by starting small, we ensure that the program is flexible and capable of amendment so that it can one day run more complex simulations. As for the future of this work, we will begin to assign realistic values to the simulation to represent a real-world scenario. As time goes on, we'll start to introduce more complexity and external influences. However, I must confess that the ultimate goal of this work is to begin developing some of the technology that could potentially replicate what we see in the simulation, but for that, more research is required. This work, and the work of many others in programmable matter, promises the hope of one day being able to master the art of creation. Perhaps circuits can be pieced together atom by atom. 3D printing may evolve from the use of extruded material to structures made from the ground up. And buildings, whether here or elsewhere, may rise from tanks of dust or liquid to make shapes with the waves of one's hand. Turning the technologies of science fiction to reality is certainly a dream worth building. Thank you kindly for your time. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, which I will gladly take, please feel free to email me at mezace16 at gmail.com. Once again, many thanks, and please have a great rest of your day.